we're going to start again. Okay, we're great. Hi, my name is Brian Ellis, and I'm from Niagara Falls, New York. I was 10 years old in 1968 um, when Martin Luther King was assassinated. And during this time, I, for some reason, I decided that I would create a scrapbook. Now, as a 10-year-old, I, I like to read a lot. I read the newspaper, comic books, I read the Bible. Anything you throw at me, I would read it. And I was struck by this event. And I think another reason I was so struck by it was that, that same year earlier, a friend of mine um, who was 10 years old um, died of brain aneurysm. So I was kind of struck by death. It had never really happened in my life um, until this time. So I created this scrapbook, which I saved um, over the years. I have shown it to people from time to time, but I usually bring it out during Black History Month. Um, or if I get a chance with some my godchildren or so, I try to share that with them so they can learn about the history that happened before them and with my son. It was especially useful when Barack Obama ran for president as I tried to, my son did not want to vote, and I tried to explain to him why he should vote and what people had done to make sure that, that he would have the right uh, to vote. My parents came from the South, my mother from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, my father from Lewisburg, North Carolina, right after World War II they had experienced segregation in the South. And they moved up to the North because there were jobs up North, good paying jobs in factory, a lot of industry going on in there. And they would not experience as much segregation as they did um, back where they came from. I remember my father telling me about how he was 11 years old and he didn't really get what this was all about, why he was treated differently. And his parents made him aware of how to behave in certain situations. When you went to the movie theater, you didn't go down and sit on the lower level. You went up in the balcony. When you saw Mr. So-and-so, who was usually a white person, you didn't look him in the eye. You didn't ride inside their truck. You rode on the boards on the side or you rode in the back. So they had a different perspective. And they grew up different, but Niagara Falls provided them a chance uh, for a different life. So this book is, most of this, um, these articles that are in this book were taken from the Niagara Falls Gazette at that time. And I decided to preserve them because it had gotten old and started to fade and put it in something that would last beyond me. <laughs> for lack of a better word. And I don't know, I, I was touched by this, um, and I'm sure I read every article I put in here because sure I would not have just cut it out. I would have had to read it. And I've been trying to use it now to share what this meant, what occurred, so that other people, I guess because I've grown old, um, I've become a time capsule, or as one of the kids told me uh, a couple of weeks ago, I'm an old head. Mm -hmm. So, but I think it's an opportunity to pass on um, some knowledge to let them know you're able to do the things that you do now because other people fought and some died for you to be able to do these things. So this um, is, well, I didn't put it in any certain order. Um, I just cut out things that drew my attention. And then I decided I would put them in the book and save it. I had no plans for it in the future as a 10 year old. I just was something uh, for me to do and to be able to share with it. And I'm sure my parents um, did encourage me. Um, I can't say I have a good recollection of it, but it has stood out with me. I when they had the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech that was 
held in Washington, D.C., my wife and I traveled to Memphis. We went to the Martin Luther King Museum, which was barely open at that time. They haven't even completed it, but you could go through and tour it. And it's right across the street from the Lorraine Hotel where Martin Luther King was shot. And you can go up there and you can look into the hotel. They have it preserved. You cannot go inside the room, but you can look in through the front glass. Um, there also is the building where they say um, the assassin, um, was Earl Ray, I think it was, um, shot Martin Luther King. And you can look at where his sniper perch was. Um, over there. And in the museum you can see many of the artifacts uh, that belong to Martin Luther King and some of the pieces and articles um, that were taken um, from the sniper that day. Um, it was very interesting. Um, it was very different and um, it just felt like being a part of history on that particular day. Um, and But through this, um, some of these uh, pertain to Niagara Falls because some of the leaders in Niagara Falls um, back at that time were some of your church leaders and they were very active in um, advocacy um, for the black community um, during that time and during that time you had a coming together not of just the African Americans but people who were white um, who also grieved the loss of Martin Luther King. Um, that was also a time of great turmoil because a lot of people started rioting as a means of expressing their anger and grief because they had lost uh, a hero. And Martin Luther King was only 39 years old, I believe, at the time of his death. He was very young, and they could see that he was going to help lead the African-American population to um, new levels and because of our constitutional rights to be enforced and carried out and for men of all color and races to be seen as equal as our Constitution talks about, but he was there to help make sure it was implemented. Some did not agree with his uh, ideas and philosophy because he was for nonviolence. Many people wanted to be violent as they thought for some reason this would speed up the process or at least it would satisfy the anger and vengeance that they sought. Uh, I for one, I believe in Martin Luther King's nonviolence philosophy. Um, anybody can be aggressive and violent but it takes someone to be patient. I've always felt that there's no need to become like the one you feel being oppressed by because then you've taken on the values and behavior of the oppressor. Do you remember if they talked about it in school? I, well, you know, really? No, I don't remember that. That it was? At that time. I. I think that there may have been some cancellation of schools because there was um, some rioting going on in Niagara Falls. I know there was rioting definitely going on in Buffalo, New York, which is only 20 miles from Niagara Falls. So, and I don't remember anything, I mean, a 10 year old, mm -hmm. you, you really don't get that picture and I'm sure to some degree your parents try to shield you um, from that. Uh, but we want to learn more uh, about it. Um, my uh, family was close to um, some of the leaders, particularly the pastors, the black pastors in Niagara Falls, New York. So they were uh, quite aware. And some people and will probably be leery um, because uh, violence meant that the police were going to be quite aggressive towards you. So I don't think, I know my parents didn't go out marching and looting and all that kind of stuff. That's just not who they were. But. Um, 
they felt strongly about it. But it wasn't something that, as a 10-year-old, we got exposed to a lot. Um, Niagara Falls was an integrated city. Um, when I went to elementary school, we didn't go to any segregated places. I went to a relatively new school called 39th Street School. And from my entire time, I went to school with people of all colors. Um, my teachers didn't treat me different. I have one lady I really, I told you the best teacher I ever had, Mrs. Brown. Mrs. Brown didn't make me feel like I couldn't do, I couldn't achieve. She encouraged me. And when she felt I was not acting up to my potential, she would tell me. <laughs> so she saw us going in um, high places, you know, as long as we were motivated and willing to do the work. But she always encouraged us to do it. But um, they didn't tell me I was going to have to grow up to be a janitor or anything like that. They just said, just do what you do and do best. And I told them I always had um, felt a little pride because we played a game in elementary school uh, with flashcards. And what you do is you stood next to the desk and the teacher would take the flashcard and put it up. Whoever answered first, you either sat down where that person, the person sitting down beat you, you sat in their desk. If you beat them, you went on to the next person. Mm -hmm. And I was in a combination grade. I was in with third and fourth graders all through. I had Mrs. Brown for my teacher for probably the next three or four years. So we were in combination grades until I got to sixth grade. But I had gotten pretty good at beating the ones above me. So I, I took great pride in that. But uh, we also, um, as I know part of it, black history, is that Mrs. Brown, there was a series done by, uh, narrated by Bill Cosby. And that's when I think I got exposed to more than Martin Luther King, Booker T. Washington, Harriet Tubman, uh, Rosa Brown, um, because they showed the history of African Americans f from being in Africa, the cultures, the cities, um, how great they were. They weren't little simple people living in huts and chasing down animals to kill and climbing trees for bananas and coconuts. So you got to see a history that wasn't generally, was being taught. And then there was, of course, a series of books, which I've been trying to find again online. Because, like I said, I like to read. When I found those books, I started grabbing those books and I started reading those books. So they really opened us up to a different world and how you should be seen, that you should be proud of who you are because our culture was not teaching us that we had any history. We were just slaves and that's all that we were born out of. So that was quite different. But getting back to the book, mm -hmm. <laughs> as I said, um, it was, it, it was kind of interesting, alarming, and kind of scary because when you're reading, you're, you're seeing troops being sent into some of the bigger cities. Chicago, except Buffalo, New York City, D.C., um, people destroying, people getting killed um, for this, and some of the leaders um, trying to quell the rioters and bring peace because those who riot um, frequently um, suffered by the hands of the police. Um, police were not hesitant to shoot. Um, they called in the National Guard in some places. Um, you might get beaten uh, for what you did. So it was definitely something that I had not been exposed to. Um, I don't remember if, excuse me, <coughs> <coughs> going to the services that were being held throughout the city by the politicians, um, different services were being held in uh, different churches and things like that. Um, but again, back to the book again, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I, I had, I don't know, I put this together just as a memento. I, did, I didn't think about it having any future purpose. 
you know, but as I grew old, I decided that, you know, there have been times where we've been celebrating Black History Month at the church I attend, that I would bring that and they would put this out on the table uh, for people to look through. And I try to encourage uh, the younger generations to, you know, just look at it, get a bit of your history, because some of them, but most of them nowadays, uh, probably two or three generations behind me, don't know anything about this or have not really suffered any of it to realize it. And I know myself on uh, some of the things that people have told me, I'm like, I don't know how you made it. That to live down in the South. And a lot of people that I, I know from South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, they have a different view. They were lived on farms, and they were probably the first generation who went away to colleges and got degrees, and some of them are executives, doctors, scientists, and who've always wanted better for their children, um, like my parents did. They wanted me to go on to college, and my sister, uh, it was not acceptable to not excel at school and do the work. Um, if not, it was not going to be nice at home. <laughs> so um, they, they really did. My, my parents, I think my mother more or less, my father was always, I guess, quiet, strong. My mother, um, I always described her as a miniature pit bull. <laughs> She's only stood five feet tall. Uh, that probably was with heels. But she was not afraid to speak her mind and she probably was the one more who encouraged or uh, planted seeds in us to um, grow and more or less re represent be a good representation you know uh, my mother always assured that I understood something no one was better than me nor was I better than anyone else. So I took that to mean it's a level playing field and I'm not gonna let you talk down to me and make me feel that because of the color of my skin, I was less than you. Um, because when it comes time to get in report cards, I was getting um, what they were, I was getting better than a lot of other people, I must say. Um, because I was on the honor roll, I was in the honor society mm -hmm. when I was in high school. But I want to tell you about the bad things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, this now this book has become um, something that I can um, share with others. Um, I had an opportunity today because I read to children in the West Virginia Read Aloud program to be able to share this for this material yet. But before I was leaving today, um, the principal stopped me. Evidently, the teacher, Mrs. Fox, told her about, we'll call it, the book. <laughs> and um, she wanted to look at it. So before I came here today, she went and she wanted to thumb through it and look at some of the, uh, the history. And I think what she said captured her mind was, it's history that was happening then. It's not like you're going back, Googling it, watching a YouTube video, but it is what was happening in, the t in real time um, during there. And it was one of those things where it was not over in a day. And the other irony of it was this happened in April. Two months later, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. It was a very turbulent time. There was a lot of unrest. Um, civil rights was uh, sort of, um, I guess, crescending might be the word I would use. Um, it was encouraging people of color to be more involved in their life. And some of these things, though, they started off with a lot of 
violence and rioting, out of that still was born people becoming more educated, uh, more aware, I guess the word we use now is woke, um, but they became more aware. Um, some people uh, became afraid because you started the slogans of black power. Um, you had the Black Panthers. I have a friend who was a former Black Panther. And it wasn't, and I guess from my side, it wasn't that you felt that you were more superior. It was saying, I'm, I'm on equal ground. I think one of the last marches that Martin Luther King did was with the sanitation workers. I can't remember if it was in Alabama or Memphis at the time. But they were carrying signs and they were simple. I am a man. And I think that was more, for me, that was more with black power with men. I'm a man. Treat me like a man. You're not better than I am. I have the same capabilities, abilities, desires that you have. I just have a little bit more melanin in my skin. My hair is different. My physical features may be different than yours, but I come from the same creator. I am a man, just like everyone else. Mm. So I will, um, let me see here. But like I said, throughout the community where I lived in Western New York, mm -hmm. um, there was violence and they were trying to um, quell this violence. Um, my future high school, Niagara Falls High School, kids walked out, but they weren't being violent. They walked out. It was a means of their protesting. Um, I can remember a time where there was violence at my high school that had nothing to do about civil rights. It had to do with um, fighting coming between black and white students. Uh, believe me, um, when gunfire takes place, I don't run toward the gunfire. I get out of there. So, um, but there was a lot of um, sadness. Um, and like I said, not everybody believed in Martin Luther King's nonviolent stance. Um, Stokely Carmichael was one. And there's an article here that Carmichael says Negroes must retaliate, Negroes must get vengeance. Now, I think it was during the, the Selma uh, March when they were going to cross the bridge. And over across the other side of the bridge was a large contingency of police with dogs. They decided that day, today is not the day, to take that march across the bridge. I say that because you're going to seek vengeance against the police which then is going to cause a deployment of the National Guard. You're not going to win. All you're going to do is have bloodshed and senseless violence. You're not going to promote. You've got to stay with the long game because it was when people saw how um, African Americans were being treated, when it was being televised, the beatings, the dogs, the fire hoses that America woke up because all they did was hear about it. They got to see it. They couldn't say, this is fake news. They had to accept the reality that African Americans were being mistreated and they had a right to protest. And in my opinion, that was a very important point in history because things seem to move more favorable for the African American when the rest of the world and white citizens joined in because their voice was going to be heard and now they could see there is something wrong in America best country in the world, but it has problems. But we are here, we're not leaving. <laughs> we want to contribute. We want people to know 
the story because it's important to know the story in order to one understand number two we hope not to fall back and I won't get into that political discussion at this time <laughs> but we are very divided Martin Luther King I don't know if we ever have another one like Martin Luther King Martin Luther King though he was strongly involved in civil rights he didn't stand just for African Americans but African Americans were in greater need of what he had to give at the time when he was joining the protests with the um, sanitation workers they weren't just black sanitation workers he was favorable for getting better wages for sharecroppers he was his thing also was about those who are poor to give them a better life too now yes there were poor black people but you go through Appalachia and all that you will find that there's many poor white people also mm -hmm. so his focus wasn't strictly on African Americans but that was his primary idea so I think it's important for people to understand that um, Martin Luther King was a great man, but he was a man. He had faults, like any other human being has. Um, his memory um, is a good memory. Um, history, as we know, goes on, tells the whole side to everything. And I don't care who you are, you will find that any man that you look at close enough has warts. But they also are capable of doing good things. So, um, so tell me about your the trip to the school today. So when you were there, mm -hmm. is the, what, what was the feel? You weren't there. You were there to do your regular reading, right? Yes. So, the idea that it's Black History Month was it? Was it? Were you aware in the school that it was? Well, I had decided, mm -hmm. um, as I did. Um, I know last year, maybe the year before that, during my uh, time, I would, especially in Black History Month, even throughout the year, I, I read stories of people of various cultures. Mm -hmm. But I was trying to put an emphasis on Black history, so I would always read something relative. To black history but prior to my going I, I didn't want to I'm a guest mm -hmm. so I wanted to make sure what I brought was going to be welcome so I asked the teacher in advance Mrs. Fox and we decided that the book itself and the content was a little too intense for mm -hmm. kindergartners and evidently what she did so she told me to bring the book because she wanted to look at it mm -hmm. so I said okay I'm gonna remember to bring the book for that also and evidently she told the principal and I was surprised I was just getting ready to scoot out here and get over to the library today and she wanted to look at it also so uh, I was more than happy uh, to share it you never know who you're going to inspire and I told him some people are like dry wood you just need to add just a little bit of flame to them and boom you you, you got a big fire going on in a positive way that you can spread so um, I was so what I did though is I will pull this out I had a little bit of personal history yeah great um, in it and I was um, today uh, because in 1956 a year before I was born <laughs> Martin Luther King came to Niagara Falls and he went to uh, New Hope Baptist Church which is the oldest black church in Niagara Falls New York my grandfather James Ellis um, was a deacon there and the pastor at the time was Pastor Whitaker who married my mother and father um, the following year in 57 I'm not going to go into the rest of that story, but anyhow. <laughs> but Martin Luther King was here, so 
this is the is this a good spot? That's this good. Is the picture here. So, this is my grandfather here, James Ellis. This is Reverend Whitaker, and right there is Martin Luther King. And Martin Luther King came to talk to the um, people who were gathered that day about the march, the boycott in Alabama, uh, which started, according to the article, December 5th, 1955. And he gave this pr uh, presentation, as I'm reading here, there was a special 3.30 p.m. service. And known Baptist, there was a meal served before that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and probably some very good food. <laughs> but um, his talk was entitled, I'm looking here in this article, The Montgomery Story. And um, he um, came there and um, shared um, some stories about life down in that area, in Alabama. I have relatives now down in Alabama, Montgomery. Alabama. Matter of fact, we went to the um, museum down there and visited the site where I believe Martin Luther King and Coretta are both buried um, during our visit down there. Matter of fact, I think I do have some photos uh, from that visit um, over there. So my wife and I, we took our time when we went down there for the celebration to go visit some of the places down there. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the church over there. Was at Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is right down there from the museum, all within walking distance over there. So I was disappointed, though, in the fact that uh, I think I was told I couldn't take any pictures in the museum over there. Really? So I don't know if it's Martin Luther King Museum versus the Civil Rights Museum, but for some reason, uh, so I do what I do. Hey, you tell me no, then no. I, I want to try to play by the rules.